We hope that you're enjoying our Ministerium Lenten services. We're so honored to be able to share the word of the Lord with you in this time of preparation, in this time of reflection that leads up to that great act on the cross, the death of Jesus Christ for our sin, dying for our sin, suffering for us. We thank you once again for joining us. I hope you enjoy today's service. Be blessed. Let us bow our heads in reverence to our God. Most gracious God, God of love, through this Lenten journey, purify my desires to serve you. Free me from any temptations to judge others, to place myself above others. Please let me surrender even my impatience with others, that with your love, and your grace, I might be blessed and less absorbed with myself, and more and more full of the desire to follow you, in laying down my life according to your example. Amen. I'm sure you have heard or perhaps even used the phrase, I'll believe it when I see it. Many people feel that they can only believe what they can see, feel, or touch. But is that really a good criterion for judging that something is real? Just because you can see it, can you really believe it? Some years ago, I went with friends to see Dr. David Copperfield 
uh, at the Civic Arena down in Pittsburgh. Now, let me tell you what, he was so amazing. We had seats by the aisle, which was really great seats. And during this uh, the program, David came into the audience and he walked up our aisle of all places, and you'll never guess, he stopped right next to our row of seats. And there he took a $10 bill and he set it on fire. And as it burned, this beautiful white rose came out of the ashes. Now, I don't know if he burned a $10 bill. I, I doubt that he did. But I'm going to tell you what, that white rose was real. And I know it was real because he gave it to my friend who was sitting in the end aisle, or in the end seat. I love magicians and illusionists because you know that what you're watching happen really isn't happening. And yet, there it is, happening. Seeing is believing, right? My point is that you cannot believe everything you see. To truly believe in something, you must have faith that it is real and true. Look at the definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Today's scripture tells us about two disciples who are walking along the road to Emmaus. We're in Luke 24, verses 13 to 35, if you want to look it up. Now we know that one of them is Cleopas, but there has been much speculation about the other. Some believe it was Matthias, and some have suggested that it may also have been the wife of Cleopas. Although there's no way for us to know for certain, the fact that wives and children were often disregarded in the writings of that time make it likely that it may have been the wife of Cleopas. They seem to have been from the same household because if you look at verse 29, it says that they invited Jesus to stay with them. Dr. James Boyce, who until he passed, was the senior minister at Philadelphia's 10th Presbyterian Church, wrote an article about the road to Emmaus. And in that article, he says that you will find a second mention of Cleopas in another account of the resurrection in John 19, verse 25, where we read, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. So we may therefore assume that she was the one that was returning to Emmaus with him on that morning of the resurrection. Now, if you're thinking, I've never heard of a disciple named Cleopas, it's because he wasn't one of the original twelve that was with Jesus all the time. But there were many other disciples. If you look at verses 9, verse 9, it says, When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. And it's eleven now because of Judas, of course. The two, the two of them were walking home and discussing what had happened. They were frightened, confused, and bewildered by the events of the previous days. Jesus was dead. How could this have happened? How could a week that started with a joyful, triumphant celebration end with a horrible, torturous death? How could all those people who had been shouting Hosea and blessed is he just days later be shouting crucify him? As they walked along, Jesus joined them. And the Bible tells us that they were kept from recognizing him. What do you think that means? Did he look so different that they couldn't recognize him? I doubt that because Mary and the other disciples immediately recognized him. 
When Jesus asked them, what were you discussing while you were walking along? They were absolutely dumbfounded. I mean, I can imagine their eyes just popping open and their mouth popping open in, in shock. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that happen here these days? Today, today we probably would have said it different. We probably would have said something like, what rock have you been hiding under? And Jesus says, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he could be the one who was going to redeem Israel. And then today, three days after all this took place, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels and who said he was alive. And some of our companions went to the tomb and, and found it just as the women had said. But they didn't see Jesus. Can you hear the disappointment and the doubt in Cleopas's words? He didn't say they found the tomb empty and angels told them Jesus was alive. He said the woman had a vision. It's clear that he had no faith in her testimony. And he refers to Jesus in the past tense. They had, besides all that, they surely were walking down the road to Emmaus celebrating that Jesus was alive. It's obvious that they were doubting that Jesus was really who, who they had thought he was. And this is just one more time that I can see Jesus just rolling his eyes. And he says, how foolish you are. Didn't the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into glory? You know, I, I wonder why he didn't just say, hey guys, what's wrong with you? It's me, Jesus. I have risen just as I told you I would. That was probably for the same reason that they were prevented from recognizing him in the first place. He knew they lacked faith. And if he had identified himself, they might have become so excited that they wouldn't remember anything he said. And then he began to teach them. We know that Emmaus is about seven miles from Jerusalem, which for an average person would be about a two hour walk, but since they were in such a deep conversation, it may have taken a little bit longer. You know, when I think about this, I would love to have been on that walk, wouldn't you? Verse 27 says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to him all that was said in the scriptures concerning himself. Here's some scriptures that I think he would have used. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. And you must listen to him. Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. He was like one who people turned away from. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to slaughter, and like a sheep was silent before his shearers, so he did not open his mouth. And one more, Zechariah 12, 10, then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David and the residents of Jerusalem, and they will look at me the one they pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for the end, an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. And there are so many, many more, and Jesus spent the time to share them. He wanted them 
to believe so they could see who he was. He knew that they had truly been convinced they would not have doubted the women. And just as Luke says in 1631, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone arises from the dead. Maybe that's why God prevented his disciples from recognizing Jesus. Even if they had seen him, they may not have believed. In John 20, we read of Thomas's encounter with Jesus. We all know the story of how John said, I won't believe. Thomas said, I'm sorry. No, Thomas said, I won't believe it until I see it. And he did believe. And Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. The blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Our reading says, when the disciples reached Emmaus, they asked Jesus to join them in a meal. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Can you imagine their astonishment, their embarrassment? How could we not know? They would ask each other. Didn't our hearts burn when he was talking to us? So they got up immediately walked the seven miles back to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those others assembled with them. And saying to them, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And the two told them what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. This is what I mean. When I say, believing is seeing. Scripture gives us testimony as to who Jesus is. And it is just as effective today in showing us what to believe. And when we do believe, we see that without a doubt, we can all join in the words of the wonderful Easter hymn that says, I serve a living Savior. He's in this world today. I know that he is living. No matter what men say. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Believing 